This subject, Babylon, begins where all important Bible subjects begin, that is in the first three chapters of Genesis. So can we turn to Genesis chapter 3 please, and verse 15. And here is the great promise of redemption which God gave in Eden. Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 God said And I will put enmity between thee, the serpent, and the woman and between thy seed and her seed it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel So just think about the context here now in Genesis chapter 3 They are in the Garden of Eden They have broken God's commandment They have eaten of the tree of which God commanded Thou shalt not eat of it and now God is offering redemption. Who is he speaking to? Not to the man, not to the woman, but to the serpent. And he says to the serpent, you will be the head for a time. And the word head there in Genesis 3.15 is the Hebrew word rosh, which we'll meet time and again as we go through. But eventually, your rosh, your head, will be crushed by the seed of the woman, whose heel you will bruise in the process. So, there he is. I would guess that some of you in the room are rather glad that he's a static image on the screen, rather than slithering around the room. Because if he bites you, you're dead. And that's what scripture says. The sting of death is sin. And that's what he represents. So, with that foundation, let's move on now to Genesis chapters 9, 10, and 11. And here we have the account of the building of the Tower of Babel by Nimrod. And Nimrod's there in Genesis chapter 10 and verse 8. And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. Let's just have a look at the, the genealogy and the chronology of the time. So there's Noah, and Noah comes out of the ark 1657 years after creation. So the dates on there are what are called AM dates, Anno Mundi, the year of the world. Noah has three sons, Shem, Ham and Japheth. And if we just look at Genesis chapter 11 and verse 10, we read there these are the generations of Shem. Shem was an hundred years old and begat our Faxad two years after the flood. So there's our Faxad born in 1659. Now Nimrod is the second generation after the flood. Ham begat Cush and Cush begat Nimrod. So let's say, just for sake of saying something, that, that Cush was born ten years after the flood. Cush probably got Nimrod when Cush was about 30, because that's about the age that men begat their first children in, in those days. So roughly 40 years after the flood, birth of Nimrod. So when did Nimrod start his great work of building the Tower of Babel? Well, let's imagine that was another 40 odd years on. Maybe it was sooner. But 1747 for the Tower of Babel the beginning of it, 90 years after the flood. Nimrod means, we will rebel. And if you look at Genesis chapter 11 and verse 3, they said one to another, go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. Verse 4, and they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower, and let us make us a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. But God had commanded them to do exactly that, to, to be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Genesis chapter 9 and verse 1. God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And they said, No, we're not going to do that. We're going to stay in one place and we're going to build a city and a tower. We read in Genesis 11 verse 1 that the whole, earth, the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar. Remember that, we shall meet that again. That's where they are, in the land of Shinar. 
And verse 4, they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top, whose rosh, whose head may reach unto heaven. Let us make us a name. Hebrew for name is Shem. <coughs> lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Now, these chapters in Genesis show us there is already a division among men at this time. So, turn back to Genesis chapter 10 and verse 8. And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord, whereof it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom, oh, so he was a king. He's the first king mentioned in the Bible. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel. Now, the Hebrew word that's there is actually the word Babel. It means confusion. And it occurs twice in these chapters. It's in 10 verse 10, and it's in 11 verse 9, translated Babel, in each place. But in the other 257 places where it occurs, this exactly same Hebrew word is translated Babel. So, so Babel is the transliteration, Babylon is the, the translation, the name that we know in our English language. So, back into Genesis 10 verse 10. The beginning of his kingdom was Babylon, and Erech and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shinar. So that's where Babylon was, it was in the land of Shinar, and that's where they built the tower. So, <clears throat> here is Nimrod, and he has a kingdom, and he is ruling over all these cities. Now, contrast that with Genesis chapter 9 and verse 24 onwards. Genesis 9 verse 24, And Noah woke from his wine, and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, name, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. So here we have the division of men, here in Genesis 10 and 11, 9 and 10. So there's Nimrod. Let's make us a name. He's a mighty one. He has a kingdom. There are cities in the land of Shinar. And here is Shem, whose name means name. And he's dwelling in tents. So he's a stranger and a pilgrim in the earth. And if you want the blessing of God, you go and dwell in the tents of Shem, not in the cities of Nimrod. So here's, here's the division among men. So, in Genesis 11, we have there built, in the land of Shinar, this tower, whose rosh, whose head, might be, might reach unto heaven. So, what did they build? Well, there's an artist impression of what they called Etemenanki, the temple of the foundation of heaven and earth. So, it isn't just a tower, it's a temple for the performance of the religious rites of the Babylonians of whom Nimrod was the king. It wasn't constructed for the worship of the creator of heavens and earth. It was, it was constructed for the worship of Babylonian gods. If you wanted to worship the creator of heaven and earth, you went to Shem's tent, not to Nimrod's tower. They didn't finish it as Genesis 11 tells us, and we shall see later on who did. So, what did, how did God respond to this? Verse 5 of Genesis 11, And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, margin, confusion, translation, Babylon, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them 
abroad upon all the face of the earth. Now we have here in these verses a huge problem for evolutionists, whether they be atheistic evolutionists or theistic evolutionists. I came across a statement some time ago by two eminent linguists who said language evolution is the hardest problem in science. When I was preparing this study, I thought I'll just look that up and check the source. Uh, and I found that recently there has been published a book by two eminent linguists on the subject of language evolution. And chapter one is entitled The Hardest Problem in Science. Because you see, they have no evidence of how language, quote, evolved. In 1866, the French Academy banned all discussion on how language came into being, because it was such a controversial subject. And apparently, according to the article that I read, this book is the first significant textbook on the subject that's been published since that ban in 1866. And uh, it discusses the theories by which man might have evolved the ability to speak to his fellow man. And when I tell you the names of these theories, you'll, you'll see the state that these scientists are in. So there's the Bow Wow theory, there's the Poo Poo theory, there's the Ding Dong theory, there's the Yo He Ho theory, there's the Tata theory. All different. They don't know. But this is only the start. Language evolution. How man evolved the ability to speak to his fellow man. Hardest problem in science? No. Not at all. The Ethnologue Catalogue of World Languages lists 6,909 different languages that are in this world. Why should man evolve all these ways of not being able to communicate with his fellow man once he's evolved the ability to do it? It makes no sense at all. But the Bible has a simple and consistent answer. God did it. Keep a finger in Genesis and turn to Acts 17. Here's the Apostle Paul instructing the wise of his world, the eminent philosophers of Athens, who thought they knew it all. Acts 17, Paul's speech. We'll start at verse 24. Acts 17, verse 24. God that made the world and all things therein. Whenever we have a record of Paul preaching to Gentiles, he always starts in Genesis 1. He starts with creation. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worship with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood, so there's only one man in the beginning, of all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. So the Africans are in Africa because God put them there. The Australians are in Australia because God put them there, and so forth. And he determined their times. And incidentally, Deuteronomy 32 verse 8 said he did that on the basis of the number of the children of Israel. And of course in Genesis 11 there was no children of Israel to number. But God knew. So he reserved that land for Israel and put everybody else all around it. Even the EU recognizes this problem. There's the European Parliament building there on the right, based on Bruegel's picture, Bruegel's painting of the Tower of Babel. And there's Europe's slogan, Europe, many tongues, one voice. They're trying to undo what God did at Babel. So it all started in Babylon, in the land of Shinar, in the land of the Chaldees. So when did all this happen? Well, I suggested that they started to build the tower 
round about 1746 years after creation. Let's look at Genesis 11 now, and verse 10. These are the generations of Shem. Shem was a hundred years old and begat Arphaxad two years after the flood. Verse 12, Arphaxad lived five and thirty years and begat Salah. Verse 14, Salah lived thirty years and begat Eber. Verse 16, Eber lived four and thirty years and begat Peleg. What's the significance of Peleg? Genesis 10 verse 25, and unto Eber were born two sons, the name of the one was Peleg, for in his days was the earth divided. So that's the date of the scattering of the peoples. And it's 1,758 years after creation. It's 101 years after the flood. And by that point, men had turned their backs on God, built these cities, instituted the worship of the Babylonian deities and caused God to scatter them over all the face of the earth. But when God did that, I believe that he left one family there in the land of the Chaldeans. One family, one group, one race. If we now go to Acts chapter 7, uh, keep a finger in Genesis, we'll be back. But if we go now to Acts chapter 7, to Stephen's speech, Stephen, by the wisdom given unto him, tells us something about this. So, Acts chapter 7, and verse 2. He said, Men, brethren, and fathers, hearken. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran, and said unto him, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and come unto a land that I shall show thee. Then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans, the land of Shinar, the territory of Babylon and Erech and Akkad and Calneh, that Nimrod had built. And from thence, when his father was dead, he removed him into this land, where ye now dwell. So if God is saying to Abraham, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, that ye receive not of her plagues, for her sins have reached unto heaven. That's Tower of Babel. There in, in Revelation 18, God hath remembered her iniquities. So Abraham is called to come out of Babylonia, because Babylonia was the center of the kingdom of man. And Abraham is called to go into the land which will become the, will become the center of the kingdom of God. Now, if we move on to Hebrews chapter 11, we have another inspired commentary there. Hebrews chapter 11, again we're with Abraham. Hebrews 11 verse 8 By faith Abraham when he was called to go out into a place which he had after received for an inheritance obeyed Come out, said God from among them and be separate And he went out not knowing whither he went Verse 10 He looked for a city which hath foundations whose builder and maker is not Nimrod but God Verse 13, these all, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth, just like Shem in his tent. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country, land of Shinar, from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity of, to have returned. But now they desire a better country that is in heavenly, whereas wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. So they will eventually dwell in a city. Not a city built by Nimrod and the children of men, but the city built by God. And because they had that hope, they would not go back to the land of Shinar, to Babylon. 
So let's us go back now to Genesis and let's turn to Genesis 14. <clears throat> so Abraham's now in the land. He's a stranger and a pilgrim in a land that is not then his. He's dwelling in tents. And what do we read in Genesis 14 verse 1? It came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar. Here's the current king of Babylon, the current king of the kingdom of men, who comes with Arioch, king of Elisar, Kedalaama, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of nations. And they come into the land which God has promised to Abraham. Here's the seed of the serpent invading and seeking to bite the seed of the woman. And they came from the north. And what happened? Well, Genesis 14 tells us that Abraham and his servants and his Amorite allies who were in covenant relationship with him and his God pursue them and vanquish them. Lot was taken and subsequently rescued by Abraham who then gives tithes to Melchizedek who is the king, Genesis 14 verse 17, the king, sorry verse 18, the king of Salem, king of peace. And Hebrews tells us that he is first king of righteousness, Melchizedek, and after that king of Salem, because you can't have peace without righteousness. So here is the king of the kingdom of God, ruling in Jerusalem. And Abraham gives him tithes of all. So what's the result of all this? The result of all this is the seed of the woman was bruised in the heel. Lot was taken. But the seed of the serpent had his head crushed. Because verse 17 of Genesis 14 says, And the king of Sodom went out to meet Abraham after his return from the slaughter of Kedalaama and of the kings that were with him. He, he didn't just creep round the edge of their camp and snatch the hostages and... No. He put them to flight. He destroyed them, as Genesis 3 said would happen. This is the first outworking of that conflict which was prophesied in Genesis 3.15. And it's the last time, as far as I'm aware, that Babylonians come into the land for a thousand three hundred years wasn't until 2 Kings 17 when the king of Assyria brought Babylonian captives and planted them in the cities of Samaria. So there's our foundation in the book of Genesis. Great promise in Genesis 3, the building of the tower in Genesis 11, the setting up of Nimrod, the king of the kingdom of men, and the conflict between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. Let's move on now to the prophecy of Daniel. Prophecy of Daniel chapter 1. And now we find Nebuchadnezzar is the king of the kingdom of men. He is the head, the rosh of the serpent. And he has bruised Daniel and his friends so that they cannot bear seed. Daniel 1 verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Ah, king of Babylon. He's come from the land of Shinar, where the Tower of Babel was. Unto Jerusalem, city of Melchizedek, and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. So we're dealing with exactly the same issues as we had in, in Genesis. The seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And the tower was still standing. It was still there in Babylon. Because archaeologists have found an inscription written by Nebuchadnezzar concerning that tower. He said, it was begun by a former king, they reckon 42 ages ago, but he did not complete its head, its rush. That's exactly what Genesis 11 says. 
I, says Nebuchadnezzar, have highly exalted its rosh with bricks covered with copper. This tower is the eternal house, the most ancient monument of Babylon, started by Nimrod, and Nebuchadnezzar finished its head. So, Daniel chapter 2, we have the great vision of the image, which we know well, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and, and the latter days. To whom was this great vision revealed? It was revealed to the seed of the serpent, Nebuchadnezzar himself. And what did Daniel say to him? Verse 37, Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of heaven hath he given into thy hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head, this rush of gold. So there he is. And his conflict is against the temple in Jerusalem. And he took the vessels of that temple from the house of Israel's God and put them in the house of his God in the land of Shinar. And what happened? Daniel chapter 5 and verse 1. Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, there in Babylon, in the land of Shinar, made a great feast to the thousand of his lords and, to drank, and drank wine before the thousand. Belshazzar, while he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels, which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of all the temples of all the lands which he had conquered. No, it doesn't say that, does it? Which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem that the king and his princes and his wives and his concubines might drink thereof. And they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God which was at Jerusalem. And the king and his princes and his wives and his concubines drank in there. This wasn't a general celebration of Nebuchadnezzar's victory over all nations. This was a specific insult the God of Israel. And what happened to the head of the kingdom of Babylon? Verse 30. In that night was Belshazzar the king of the Chaldeans slain. He touched the vessels of God's house and he was a dead man. Another similar instance of that is in the book of Esther where Haman is given the king's ring and he uses it to sign the decree that he issued to slay all the Jews. Four days later he's dead, hung on his own gallows. That's what happens when people touch God's people. So, what happened to Babylon? Well, the Medes and Persians conquered it, and they ruled it. And then Alexander the Great came along. And he dwelt in Babylon for a time after he'd conquered as far as India. And he looked at this temple, the most ancient monument in Babylon, and he said, that's some historic temple that is, but I think I could do better. So being the power that he was, he set thousands and thousands of men to work for two years to take it apart brick by brick, with the intention of rebuilding it even more magnificently on the same site. But he died before the rebuilding could start. And there it is, today. 91 metres by 91 metres, 100 yards by 100 yards for those who deal in old money. Exactly the size that the Babylonian records said it was. And there's the city of Babylon, part of it. It's no more than an archaeological site. No one lives there. Exactly as foretold by God's prophets in the Old Testament. For example, Jeremiah 50 and 51, which we shall look at in a minute. So that's the end of the kingdom of Babylon. That night, Belshazzar was slain. What happened to the seed of the woman? Who'd been bruised by Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel chapter 6, verse 1. 
pleased Darius to set over the kingdom and 120 princes which should be over the whole kingdom. And over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was first, that the princes might give accounts unto them, the king should have no damage. Then this Daniel was preferred among, above all the presidents and the princes, because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. <coughs> Daniel, see the woman, becomes the head. And of course all his enemies in due course are thrown into the lion's den. In verse 17, it says that once they put Daniel in the den, they brought a stone and laid it upon the mouth of the dead, and the king sealed it with his own signet and the signet of his lords, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. And you might have a marginal reference forward to Matthew 27, verse 66, where they sealed the tomb in which was the body of Jesus, having rolled a great stone in front of it. And then we read in verse 19 of Daniel 6, Then the king arose very early in the morning, You'll find that phrase in the Gospels concerning the women going to the tomb. And the man who should have been dead wasn't in both instances. And in fact, the whole of this chapter, Daniel chapter 6, is an, an amazing acted par parallel, acted parable of the life and death and resurrection and rulership of the Lord Jesus Christ. I've got over 50 parallels between Daniel chapter 6 and Christ. But it's the same conflict as we saw in Genesis chapter 3, as we saw in Genesis chapter 11, as we saw in Genesis chapter 14. With the same end result. The kingdom of men, based in Babylon, is abased, and the kingdom of God is exalted. So let's now turn to Jeremiah 50 and 51. Now these two chapters are undoubtedly a prophecy of the destruction of Nebuchadnezzar's bubble. So Jeremiah chapter 50 and verse 17. Jeremiah 50 verse 17. Israel is a scattered sheep. The lions have driven him away. First the king of Babylon of Assyria hath devoured him, and last this Nebuchadrezzar, king of Babylon, hath broken his bones. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will punish the king of Babylon and his land, as I have punished the king of Assyria. So it's absolutely undoubtedly a prophecy of the destruction of Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon. But when Brother Thomas read these two chapters, um, he saw that there are details here which were never fulfilled when the Medes and Persians overthrew the Babylonians. And there's a, a quotation um, from an article that Brother Thomas wrote on Babylon. He noticed that in this prophecy, Babylon is to be broken in pieces by Israel. Not Medes and Persians. I mean, they are involved in the chapter, but Babylon is going to be broken in pieces by Israel. And that when Babylon is finally judged, Israel and Judah shall be repentant, seeking their God with their faces Zionward, fully determined to join themselves to him in a perpetual covenant. So look at Jeremiah 51, verse 19. The portion of Jacob, Israel, is not like them. He is the foreman of all things, and Israel is the rod of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. And he says of Israel, Thou art my battle axe and weapons of war, for with thee will I break in pieces the nations, with thee will I destroy kingdoms, and with thee will I break in pieces the horse and his rider, and with thee will I break in pieces the chariot and his rider. Verse 24, And I will render unto Babylon, and to all the inhabitants of Chaldea, all their evil that they have done in Zion, in your sight, saith the Lord. And when Babylon is judged by Israel, they will be repentant and in the covenant. Turn back to Jeremiah 50 and verse 1. Jeremiah 50 verse 1. The word that the Lord spake against Babylon and against the land of the Chaldeans by Jeremiah the prophet. Declare ye this among the nations, and publish, and set up a standard. Publish, and conceal not. Say, Babylon is taken, Bel is confounded, Merodach is broken in pieces. Remember that inscription of Nebuchadnezzar? Merodach, the great god, inspired me to do this, he said, rebuilding the tower. Merodach is broken in pieces, because he's no god. 
Her idols are confounded. Her images are broken in pieces. For out of the north there cometh up a nation against her, which shall make her land desolate, and none shall dwell therein. They shall remove, they shall depart, both men and beasts. In those days and in that time, saith the Lord, the children of Israel shall come, they and the children of Judah together, going and weeping. They shall go and seek the Lord their God. They shall ask the way to Zion with their faces thitherward, saying, Come, let us join ourselves to the Lord in a perpetual covenant that shall not be forgotten. So, therefore, Brother Thomas concluded, there must be a latter-day Babylon with all the characteristics of the original Babylon of Nimrod and Nebuchadnezzar. But, as we saw on the slide, there's nothing left there today. The base, the Tower of Babel, and a ruined city are all that's there. So now turn with me to Zechariah and chapter 5. Zechariah chapter 5, we have the vision shown to Zechariah of the woman and the ephah. Zechariah chapter 5, verse 5. Then the angel that talked with me went forth and said unto me, Lift up now thine eyes, and see what is this that goeth forth. And I said, What is it? And he said, This is an ephah that goeth forth. He said, Moreover, this is their resemblance throughout all the earth. And behold, there was lifted up a talent of lead. L lead is never used in a good sense in Scripture. That is a poisonous metal. And this is a woman that sitteth in the midst of the ephah. And he said, this is wickedness. This is a wicked woman sitting in the ephah. And he cast it in the midst of the ephah, and he cast the weight of lead upon the mouth thereof. Shut this woman up. Then I lifted I up mine eyes and looked, and behold, there came out two women. And the wind was in their wings, for they had wings like the wings of a stork. And they lifted up the ephah between the earth and the heaven. And then said I to the angel that talked with me, Whither do these bear the ephah? And he said unto me, To build it an house in the land of Shinar, and it shall be established and set there upon her own base. But it's not where Nimrod built the tower. We've seen the satellite photograph of the base, and there's nothing on it. It's bare. So, what's this all about? Well, I haven't got time to recount the whole of it. But if you go on Livonia tapes and listen to Brother Roger Lewis talking about the mysterious tale of two temples, how the Tower of Babel became the Basilica of St. John Lateran in Rome. We'll find the answers. Because what happened, very, very, very briefly, was that when Constantine fought the Battle of Milvian Bridge and defeated Maxentius, Constantine was enraged that the Praetorian Guard had supported Maxentius and not him. So he destroyed the barracks of the Praetorian Guard, raised them to the ground. But there was a little temple in the Lateran fields there, and Constantine said, no, no, I won't destroy that. He offered it to the Bishop of Rome. He said, would you like it? The Bishop of Rome said, yes, please, I'll, I'll rebuild it and you know, get it how I like it. And within about ten years, the Bishop of Rome had rebuilt this little temple into something rather more magnificent. Do you know what he called it? He called it Domus Dei, the house of God. That's got it goes back into the scriptures that we looked at, hasn't it? So there it is the Basilica of St. John Lateran in Rome. It is the Basilica of the Diocese of Rome, because one of the Pope's titles is that he is the Bishop of Rome. And this is his cathedral. The Latin word cathedra means a chair. This is where the Pope sits. And the Cardinals pronounced in 1870 that when he sat on his chair, in St. John Lateran, and spoke about faith and morals, he's infallible. Would you like to know what the title of St. John Lateran is in full? Well, there it is. Look at the first bit. It's the Arch Basilica. That means it's the Chief Basilica. 
It's the arch basilica, the chief basilica, the chief church of the most holy saviour and saint John the Baptist and evangelist at the Lateran, because it's still in the Lateran fields. It's not the original thing that the, uh, the Pope built, it's been rebuilt several times. But it's still in the Lateran fields. Of all the churches in the city and the world, the mother and the head of the wash. And we shall meet that word mother in a bit. So there it is. The religious centre has moved from Etemenanki to St. John Latra. And we notice in Zechariah 5, the woman sits in the ether. In 2 Thessalonians 2, the man of sin sits in the temple of God, showing that he is God. And the Pope sits on his cathedra, his chair, in St. John Latra. So his infallibility was declared by the cardinals in 1870. There's his cathedra, his chair, and they believe that when he sits in it, speaks on faith and morals, he's infallible. But just look at the symbology of that picture. There's the Pope sitting on a chair. It's a rather magnificent chair, isn't it? What colour is it? White. It's more than a chair, it's a throne. Revelation 20, verse 11. I saw a great <laughs> white throne, and him that sat on it. He's imitating the Lord Jesus Christ at the final judgment. And what's he got either side of him? Two cherubic figures. He's sitting between the cherubim. He's claiming that he's the mercy seat through which man can speak with God. They understand the symbology. They know what they're doing. But it's totally contrary to the ways of God. So, there's our background, there's our foundation. Let's now turn to Revelation 18. Revelation 18 is a mosaic of quotations from the Old Testament. From the Babylon, from the Babylon prophecies in Isaiah and in Jeremiah. There's, there's not time for us to work through these, but there's just an example. There's a couple of verses from Isaiah 47. Having asked you to turn to Revelation 18, keep a finger there and turn back to Isaiah 47, because we need to just look at the opening verses. Isaiah 47, verse 1. Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground. There is no throne. Well, just saw the Pope sitting on his throne. It's gone. O daughter of the Chaldeans, thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. Take the millstones and grind meal. Uncover thy locks. Make bare the leg. Uncover the thigh. Pass over the rivers. Thy nakedness shall be uncovered. Yea, thy shame shall be seen. I will take vengeance, and I will not meet thee as a man. And this is all about the destruction of Babylon. And yet Babylon is, re is represented by a woman. And we shall see in part two how this works out. But there are some of the parallels. Given to pleasures, dwelleth care carelessly, shall not sit as a widow, judgment in one day. Sorceries, it's there in Revelation 18 verse 23. The Greek word is actually pharmakia, from which we get pharmaceutical. So there's Isaiah 47. Then Jeremiah 50 and 51, which we already looked at in the context of Brother Thomas' quotation. Come out of her, my people, in Revelation 18 verse 4. Come straight out of Jeremiah 50 and Jeremiah 51. Her sins have reached unto heaven. Well, that, that phrase occurs twice in Jeremiah 51. They shall bewail her. Rejoice thou heavens. Stone cast into the sea is there in Jeremiah 51, verses 63 and 64. That great city Babylon, it's a phrase that comes straight out of Jeremiah 51, and slain upon the earth. They're just some of the parallels. Just work your way through your margin in Revelation 18 and look for some more. As well as these um, quotations from the Babylon prophecies in the Old Testament, there are at least 34 quotations from the Tyre prophecies in Ezekiel. 
because this nation, is this power, is a great trading power, as we shall see. So what's happening, if we sort of stand back now and look at the whole of Scripture, is that in the Old Testament we've got Babylon phase 1 versus the seed of the woman phase 1, which develops into Israel. And in the New Testament we've got Babylon phase 2 <coughs> versus the seed of the woman phase 2, the ecclesia. So we shouldn't therefore be surprised that the Spirit quotes and reformats itself in Revelation 18. And just as Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon was overthrown without trace, so the latter-day Babylon will go. So, back to Revelation 18. Verse 2. Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. Now, we've already met this concept twice in Revelation. Chapter 14, verse 8. There followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And that comes after Christ and the saints are established in Jerusalem, after the everlasting gospel is preached. Revelation 16 and verse 19. The great city was divided into three parts. The cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And that happens after the battle of Armageddon. So that shows us that in the outworking of God's purpose, the destruction of this latter-day Babylon comes pretty late on in the sequence of events that lead up to the establishment of the kingdom of God over all the earth. We haven't seen her full rise to power yet. We shall look at the woman on the beast in part two. But clearly, this chapter, Revelation 18, draws a picture of Babylon as a woman. She says, I am a queen and I'm no widow, in verse 7. It quotes Tower of Babel language, verse 5. Her sins have reached unto heaven. God hath remembered her iniquities. And the judgment falls upon her. Verse 7. How much has she glorified and lived deliciously? Catholic Church, as we shall see in part 2 incredibly rich despite vows of poverty sorry should have put that up getting ahead of myself so there's the uh, there's the sequence of events after the glorification of the saints preaching of the gospel after the second coming battle of Armageddon and the war with the Lamb after these things Riches of Babylon, that's a quotation from Avro Manhattan's The Vatican Billions in 1980. And there's no evidence that the Pope's gone into poverty since then. He's the richest man in the world, in effect. And there's a picture of the house of the Bishop of Limburg in Germany. He spent 31 million euros refurbishing his house. Rome thinks it's indestructible. When um, David Yallop wrote his book about the murder of Pope John Paul I, apparently he was in New Zealand signing copies of his book, and somebody on the New Zealand media interviewed some prominent Roman Catholic and said, aren't you a bit worried about this? And he said, no, in a hundred years David Yallop will be forgotten. We'll still be here in a thousand. They don't reckon with the power of God. Italy is the only country in Europe with active volcanoes. Um, that was 2013, August. That's a volcanic vent in the middle of a traffic island just by the end of the runway of Rome Airport. You know, shooting mud and stones and stuff into the air. Man cannot control that. That's the power of God. Uh, and what does Revelation say? Verse 9 of Revelation 18. The kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. Verse 18, And cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? It's going to be destroyed. Look at the description of the wealth of this city in verses 12 and 13. And the majority of them are luxury goods. And she deals in bodies and souls of men. 
And even when the judgment comes, her devotees do not acknowledge her wickedness. Verse 19, they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, that great city, wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness, for in one hour she is made desolate. Verse 20, Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you of her. The new world government rejoices in the victory and the demolition of Babylon. So, question, brothers and sisters, what's our attitude? We're on one side or the other. Do we see this system as God sees it? Verse 21, the mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. This violence has parallels with Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, where the stone smites the image on its feet. And these words are quoted from Jeremiah 51, as we have seen. So this evil system comes completely to an end, as Babylon phase 1 did because of her sorceries. Sorceries, pharmakia, occurs in Galatians chapter 5, in the list of the, words, the works of the flesh. It's called witchcraft. So, verse 24, In her was found the blood of prophets and saints, and of all that was slain upon the earth, just as the serpent and the king of Babylon slew God's servants in the past. So, now... This great city is also depicted in chapter 17 as a woman. Um, hopefully we're going to tie the two together in the second study.